Final Fantasy XIII has always had a bad reputation, from its nightmare development and failed Nova Crystallis project, to its automatic battle system, corridor running gameplay, impenetrable plot and questionable voice acting, it has been something of a black spot on the series. At least, that's what I thought, but I just checked Metacritic with the intention of showing a screenshot that backed up my point, but as you can see, the critic score is mostly positive, so now I'm confused. I remember the discourse surrounding it upon release to be mostly negative for the reasons mentioned earlier, and yet when I played it back in 2012, I remember having an absolute blast. I thought everyone was crazy for not liking it, but telling people how much I enjoyed it got me dodgy looks from faceless strangers across the internet, and after a while I started to question if I was the crazy one. I've wanted to revisit Final Fantasy XIII for years, but have always been afraid to. JRPGs are a bit of a commitment time-wise, especially how I play them, and what if it is shit and I'd just been confused or crazy back then? After all, I was only 26. I wasn't even an adult. But I'm currently off work looking after my cat who has had an operation and I need something to do while he's sleeping, so fuck it, now is the perfect time to revisit Final Fantasy XIII. Also, there will be spoilers, but the game is 13 years old, so if you haven't played it yet, that's on you, so don't get mad at me. First off, that opening scene still looks incredible. I'm playing on the Xbox Series S, downloaded from Game Pass. I don't know if it's optimised or anything, but the lack of compression on the FMV has it miles ahead of other 360 games I've played recently on the Series S. I'm looking at you, Army of Two. I know a lot of this quality is going to be lost due to recording, rendering, and YouTube's own shitty compression just destroying the fidelity of the thing, but live and in person, it is just as good as a lot of FMV sequences from the PS4 Xbox One generation. Straight into the gameplay then, and to be honest, this looks great. Sure, the backgrounds look a little like blown up and pixelated JPEGs, and the characters' fingers are kind of blocky, but the details in the environment and character faces are spectacular. Here, we're introduced to two of the main cast, a stoic and attractive ex-soldier and a black man who talks a lot and we fight a giant robot scorpion, and I can't help but feel I've done this before. Obviously, I'm talking about Lightning and Saz, two original characters for Final Fantasy XIII. The basics of the battle system are explained here. You have an active time battle gauge, when it fills up you can select an ability for the cost of a bar. For example, attack users at one bar, or you can choose to attack twice for the cost of two bars. Or you can just choose auto battle and the AI will choose the best ability combination for the situation. This has been a huge point of contention since the game was released. What's the point of playing a game if the game plays itself, etc. And as much as that point is indeed valid, I actually really like the auto battle at this early stage of the game. Abilities are limited to attack, which attacks one enemy, or blitz, which attacks multiple. I'm not spoilt for choice. There are no deep tactics this early in the game, and if auto battle is just going to select the action I was going to pick anyway, I'm grateful for the option to expedite it. I'm still pressing a button to select it, I'm still picking a target and confirming my action. I'm just cutting out the extra menu and a couple of needless steps and getting back into the action as soon as possible. In Final Fantasy VII, I just tend to hold down the circle button during mob fights anyway. Why is this any different? That's actually more automatic than this because I'm pressing fewer buttons. And everyone loves the auto attack feature in Persona 5 and you know what? I'm getting sidetracked. After the battle, we take control of Lightning and she honestly controls like shit. Running forward feels great, but when I change direction, she kind of snaps into it like Sonic in one of his 3D games. Enemies are visible on the field now, a carryover from Final Fantasy XII, and I honestly love this change to the series. I used to love random encounters when I was younger, but now they stress me out. It's hard to explain, but running from A to B and being stopped every few steps by a random encounter feels like I'm driving in slow traffic in a car that won't stop stalling. But if I do the same A to B run and can see the enemies I'm about to fight, it feels like engaging with them is my choice and the car ride feels a lot smoother. Also, did I mention how gorgeous this game is? Soon after, the bridge lightning in Sazeron is destroyed and we are treated to one of the worst character moments in anything. Lightning tries to use her power to cross the gap and Saz loses his call and grabs onto her like I grabbed hold of my dad when he left my mum. 
I'm not sure if it's supposed to represent Lightning being cold and leaving him, or Saz being a complete coward, but either way, it looks bad on both of them, and the anime-ness of it all is just really cringy to watch. The game then decides to give me a tutorial on chain bonuses and enemy staggering, despite already doing that in a couple of battles up to now. The short of it is enemies have a bar called a chain gauge. Hitting enemies increases their chain bonus and builds their chain gauge and when the gauge is full, the enemy staggers, leaving it open to increase damage. It's a bit of a wasted mechanic against weak mob enemies, but against stronger foes and bosses, it is really satisfying to use. Next, we meet Sifa from Kingdom Hearts, I mean Snow, voiced by everyone's favourite golf ball and NFT peddler, Troy Baker. <laughs> bit of a side note here. I've been a fan of Troy Baker for years and actually met him shortly after I moved to London and he was an absolute sweetheart. And despite the fact that I think NFTs are a fucking mugs game, I think it's sad that the Twitter mob tried to cancel him over it when there are worse people out there doing worse things and getting away with it, but that's none of my business. Anyway, Snow is the leader of a gang of resistance fighters going up against a group called the Sanctum. Lightning is an ex-soldier from Sanctum, and this is really starting to sound like Final Fantasy VII again, isn't it? Snow's jacket changes during combat and becomes covered in patches, and I had to google why because I thought the game had given me a weird DLC costume I didn't ask for, but it turns out the patches represent the weapon he currently has equipped, which is a really nice touch. I actually really like Snow as a character. He's like a less intense Barrett from Final Fantasy VII. He genuinely cares for his friends and those around him, and when his rebellion gets the civilians he was trying to protect killed, it genuinely affects him. It would have been easy to make him a bravado-filled meathead, but the bravado is really just a facade. There's nothing new added to the combat yet, just more running forward and auto battles and a few more cutscenes, and also this weird contradictory character moment I found hilarious. Hey Godot. Yeah? If you don't know who you've got to save, you just protect them all, right? Flashback. Now we meet and take control of two new party members, Hope and Vanille, as they nick a flying bike and enter a new area. These two start off in the first, not strictly a corridor area, and it really highlights how sluggish and clunky the character control and camera are. We also get a tutorial explaining if you attack an enemy from behind, you get a preemptive strike, which is very silly. I understand why the devs would drip feed combat mechanics as the game progresses, to keep things simple at first so newcomers don't get overwhelmed, but something as basic as hit an enemy from behind to hit first in fight isn't the sort of thing that needs to be explained two hours into playtime. Back to lightning now, and we're told about aerosols, items that are used outside of battle to give you buffs. This I can understand leaving until now, but back attacks? Come on. Aerosols, it turns out, are super useful. Fortisol, for example, boosts attack defense and casts haste for the duration of the battle. And they only seem to last as long as a fight, so saving them up for boss fights is probably the best idea. But if they're all as good as this one, I can see them actually giving me a really good edge. I actually really like this section of the game. Jumping between the three groups, Lightning and Sars, Snow and Hope and Vanille, as they make their way through this weird alien-like structure known as Vestige. It has a great sense of urgency to it. We, as players, know the three groups are destined to meet up, and each time the party switches, we know we're one step closer to kicking off the adventure proper. From the beginning of the game to the point the party meets in ascent on their quest, the pacing is superb. Dropping us into the thick of it from the off gives the scenario the same feeling as the third act of a movie, and although we're constantly pushed forward with new information being thrown at us consistently, it still feels like it's taking its time. But it's this idea that you've been dropped into the middle of an ongoing story that highlights FF13's biggest problem. How weird and confusing the story is to new players. So what I'm going to do now is explain the story two ways. First, as presented to us in-game, free of context. And then again without using any of the names and given terms in the game, and we can see which one makes sense. Humans live on Cocoon. Cocoon is above Pulse. Pulse is an enemy of Cocoon. On Cocoon, things such as weather and food production are controlled by Fao C. People chosen by Fao C become Lissy and are given a focus. However, one day a Fao C from Pulse is found on Cocoon. Because Pulse is an enemy of Cocoon, a Pulse Lissy's focus could be to destroy Cocoon, so Psycom, a branch of the Sanctum, hunt and kill any Lissy created by the Pulse Fao C in case they complete their focus or fail and become a Seath. They also round up any civilians who have been close to a Fauci and kick them off Cocoon to Pulse. Or 
kill them outright. This is called the purge. Absolute word soup. Using words we actually know, however, it starts to make a lot more sense. Humans live in the moon. The moon is above the earth. Earth is an enemy of the moon. On the moon, things such as weather and food production are controlled by magic aliens. People chosen by the magic aliens become enthralled to them and are given a special mission. However, one day a magic alien from Earth is found on the moon. Because Earth is the enemy of the moon, people enthralled by the Earth alien could have a mission to destroy the moon. So a branch of the moon's military hunt and kill anyone enthralled by the Earth alien in case they complete their mission and destroy the moon or fail and become a monster. They also round up any civilians who have been close to the Earth alien, pack them onto trains and relocate them off the moon to the planet below, or kill them outright in what is essentially a holocaust. See? Much easier to understand, right? And it isn't helped that the characters are constantly repeating this information through exposition dumps, but without context, it makes no sense. And the words Fauci, Lissi, and Seath become interchangeable and about as meaningless as the word yawn if you stare at it for too long. Luckily, there are data logs that unlock as the game progresses, which explain all this in much better detail than the characters. But JRPGs already come with a lot of reading, and it's wild the devs expect you to sit there for even longer to read a wiki about the difference between the C and Foul C. And I bet you've already forgotten. Anyway, it turns out Lightning's sister, who is also Snow's fiance, is a Lassie who fulfilled her focus and turns to Crystal in a kind of cryostasis. And now the gang are together, so it's time to fight the Pulse Foul C. When that's done, we're treated to another stunner of a cutscene with the gang being hentai to high heaven and this absolutely incredible and beautiful effect of water turning to crystal. And then it's time for a flashback in a bit of Snow and Sarah's backstory. So after all this happened, I turned it off for the night. And when I switched it on a couple of days later, I was treated to a recap of the chapter's events up to this point. I genuinely love this, and I wish more story-driven games would do it. I've lost count of how many times I've gone back to a game after some time away and can't remember what's happened due to time or alcohol, so little recaps are always welcome. Another cutscene now, and Hope realises Snow can use magic, and the gang discover they're now Lassie with a focus, to defeat Ragnarok and save Cocoon. From this point, the game opens up mechanically as we're given a tutorial on the Paradigm system. Honestly, the game does a piss poor job of explaining this system as it gets too caught up with its own terminology and wordy examples, so let me explain. Party members can now be assigned different roles. Roles are essentially classes, and as such they have unique spells, abilities and combat behaviours. These roles can be assigned to the party members by selecting Customize in the Paradigm menu. Selecting a slot in the Paradigm deck and then selecting a character shows which roles are available. Simply select a role for all three characters and you've created a Paradigm. There are countless combinations available to the party with just a bit of imagination. And once a Paradigm has been created, it's available to use in battle. Pressing the left bumper in combat brings up a list of available Paradigms. And selecting which one you want to use instantaneously switches the active party member's classes, opening up new strategic possibilities. I genuinely love the paradigm system. I'm a big fan of being able to change classes on a whim, like with Final Fantasy X-2's Dress Sphere system. And the paradigm system is essentially a much more refined, customizable, and effective version of that. It also makes the reasoning behind the auto battle make more sense. There is so much going on during battles in Final Fantasy XIII, it's easy to lose focus on the party's health bars. Juggling multiple abilities, which order to put them in, which paradigm to use and when, it's a lot. Case in point, my mind wandered during this fight here and lightning died. This leads nicely into a side note. Final Fantasy XIII commits one of the biggest faux pas in JRPGs. If the party leader, the character you control, dies, it's game over. I fucking hate this so much. It's like the game is saying everyone else on your team is a useless drone. There are so many games that do it, it drives me wild. The Shin Megami Tensei series, probably the worst for doing it. And to have to put up with it here, <laughs> I really don't like this mechanic. And I just had to mention it. Anyway, back to the magic. With Paradigms now unlocked, we also get access to the Crystarium, Final Fantasy XIII's leveling system. The in-game tutorial massively overcomplicates things, as usual, so the best way to describe the Crystarium is skill trees. That's it. Each character has multiple skill trees pertaining to their available roles. 
Skills and attributes are unlocked by spending a character's Christogen points, which they receive after winning battles. Any spells unlocked on a particular tree are usable with that role, but any attributes that are unlocked carry over. For example, if you unlock plus 20 hit points, the character now has plus 20 hit points regardless of which role they currently have. I quite like this system to be honest. It feels like a more streamlined version of Final Fantasy X Sphere Grid, and I enjoy saving up my CP and just going mad with the Crystarium unlocks. It's also worth noting that the Crystarium isn't completely available at first, with different sections and additional abilities and attributes becoming available as the story progresses, meaning it is impossible to overlevel, keeping the challenge fair but consistent. The first time I played FF13 I was frustrated by the inability to level up until this point in the game, but this time around I quite like it. It makes perfect sense from a narrative standpoint. Up until becoming the sea, these guys were just regular old humans. No special powers, no abilities, but having them gain magic powers once they become the sea not only gives an in-universe reason for why the characters are getting stronger, but it also gives context to why the Lysia are feared by the residents of Cocoon. I don't know, it just makes a nice change from the reason being because video games. Also, this game looks really fucking good. So here's a weird one. At this point in the game, I'm four hours in and it hasn't explained to me how to use equipment, so I'll do it myself. Like everything else in Final Fantasy XIII, equipping gear is super streamlined. We only have weapons and accessories to worry about, and although they can be equipped manually, there's an optimise option that will auto-equip the best gear available to the party based on if you choose balanced, offensive or defensive. Again, I love this. I'm not a huge fan of wasting time agonising over which gear to use all the time, so an auto-equip option is very welcome. That's not to say I won't agonise over gear if I have to, it's just great to not have to do it all the time. My brain just isn't wired for percentages and min-maxing, and I kind of envy people who understand all that, it's basically a foreign language to me. I don't really know how to transition from there, so here we go. From this point on, Snow leaves the party for a bit, and there is a huge spike in difficulty, and I gotta tell you, I am into it. The combat system really comes into its own, with a huge focus on finding the correct paradigm and enemy staggering. Fights against the tougher enemies feel like they're throwing the kitchen sink at you, and you really have to think fast. It's quite exhilarating, especially for what is still a turn-based battle system. Being a Final Fantasy game, 13 of course has summons. This time around they're called Eidolons, and they're not collected, and they won't just join you. You have to prove yourself in combat, and this fight is tough as hell. It took me three tries before I figured out what to do. But turns out if you just spam Libra for the first few rounds, eventually the game will tell you how to win, so that's nice. Following the requirements to impress them and pressing X when their guest out gauge is full will cause them to join you. So, in a way, they're like super picky, high-powered Pokemon. And in less time than it took them to get together, the party separates. This time, the pairings are Saz and Vanille, and Lightning and Hope. I actually don't mind this, at all. It's a good way to use otherwise neglected party members, and with the Crystarium expanding, there are more abilities and paradigms available to experiment with, as well as some much-needed attribute points. Weirdly, there's a tutorial explaining Hope's new role, Synergist, which felt unnecessary and kind of condescending in that way JRPGs do so well. And this is more of a personal peeve than anything, but I hate it when I'm literally about to do something and then someone asks me to do that thing. Similarly, if I'm literally about to do something and then someone tells me how to do the thing I'm about to do, that shit drives me mad. And that's the feeling I get when a tutorial pops up to tell me something I've already been doing for the last few hours, or to tell me something I'd have quite easily figured out myself. There's a section for primers, the imposing tutorial windows that constantly pop up, and a bunch of other tutorials in the data log section of the menu. And I can't help but think that the user experience could have been improved greatly by having all but absolutely essential tutorials in there to peruse at our leisure. Anyway, it's back to Saz and Vanille as they make their way through the vile peaks, and we get another deviation from the standard gameplay in the form of three-way battles. Three-way battles are pretty much as they sound. You'll come across two groups of enemies already locked in Mortal Kombat, leaving them open for a preemptive attack. And I'll be honest, I struggled with this section a lot more than I should have. Saz and Vanille are both magic support characters, so when compared to the likes of Lightning and Snow, they're weak as hell, and approaching fights with pure aggression all but guarantees failure. 
This section is essentially a training ground to teach the player how to use the newly unlocked Synergist and Saboteur roles, and it took me several reloads until I figured out the Saboteur spells D Protect and D Shell make enemies stagger with magic. As far as a way to actively teach the player how to use new roles, I like it. My only complaint is the lack of option to customise behaviours for the AI controlled party members. Final Fantasy XII had one of the single best AI customisation options I have ever seen in any game with its Gambit system. That system was so deep and complex, but presented in a way that was super easy to understand, and if you knew what you were doing, you could essentially set the game up to play itself. And I'm not saying FF13 should have a system like that by any means. But the ability to set spellcasting priority would have gone a long way to making certain encounters less frustrating. Saz and Vanille meet up with Hope again, and having a third party member and an understanding of how the new roles work makes things a lot easier. A few minutes later, Lightning returns and it's onward to the boss, and this fight is a lot of fun. Like the gauntlet that came before it, it's a bit of a skill check, pushing you to utilise the saboteur role to its fullest. Beating the boss opens the Crystarium some more and unlocks the ability to upgrade weapons, which is great because up to this point I've only found one new weapon for like 4 characters and I really need a replacement. Upgrading is super simple. Up to this point the party have been accumulating materials from enemy drops and from those floating spherical treasure chest things, and it's these that are used to upgrade weapons and accessories. In the upgrade section, gear need a certain number of EXP to gain a level, and each piece of material has an EXP value. So you have to use a number of different materials on the equipment of choice to build its total EXP until it levels up. Certain materials will have an EXP multiplier bonus, so you don't have to use as many materials at higher levels if you play your cards right. Simply repeat this process as many times as you like to improve your equipment until it maxes out. Just don't do what I did and forget there are other party members that need materials and upgrades too. Although I have to admit I am enjoying seeing lightning hit staggered enemies for 4 figures already. Next we get a little mini game as Hope controls a pulse dreadnought and smashes through a load of robots. It's a short diversion that doesn't outstay its welcome, which I really appreciate. I'm not a fan of overly long mini games in Square Enix titles, but being able to smash Pulse Work Soldiers felt like petty revenge and I'm into it. Shortly after, Lightning loses her temper with Hope again, but the disdain she has for the kid seems to summon the Eidolon Odin. This fight is an absolute nightmare, and the first wall I hit in what has been, up until now, a pretty fair game. The first loss was entirely my fault. I was so busy spamming Libra I forgot to heal. Second death? I'd figured out what I had to do, but I wasn't quick enough. But third time's the charm. Fourth time's the charm. Fifth time's the charm. Sixth time's the Seventh time. Eleventh time's the charm. I hate this fight with every fibre of my being. The opening flurry of attacks is absolutely devastating and it takes far too long to heal up. Then, after Odin eventually switches focus to hope, allowing me to spam heals and build the guest out gauge, I constantly ran out of time. Eventually, I used the Fortisol for the haste, and even with that buff, I barely managed to beat it in time. On the plus side, defeating Odin expanded Lightning's ATB gauge, and now Lightning has an Eidolon, we're able to use summons in battle. Summoning an Eidolon costs tech points. Once summoned, it will take the place of the other party members. Both the Eidolon and the player character have a guest out gauge. The player character's goes up when performing an action, whereas the Eidolon's goes down. If the Eidolon's gauge or hit points reach zero, they disperse from battle. Pressing X activates guest out mode and allows us to choose the Eidolon's attacks. These attacks cost points, and once the points reach zero, the Eidolon leaves the battle. To be honest, I miss the days of summoning a monster just for it to do a big attack and leave. The whole press it, twist it, bop it aspect that summons involve now just feels unnecessary. And for the amount of damage they do, at least early on, they feel a bit pointless. I'm really not a fan of summons in this era of Final Fantasy games. Focus switches back to Saz and Vanille who run around pressing switches and have a nap. And as much as I'm not a fan of Saz, I think he's far too goofy at times, I do love his baby chocobo. Back to Hope and Lightning, this time with Hope as the party leader. And that's something else I like about this game. There isn't one specific main character. It isn't very often, especially in the Final Fantasy game, where there isn't one character who is the primary focus. Cloud, Squall, Zidane, Tidus, all part of an ensemble cast of characters, but ultimately it's their adventure we go on. 
Yes, there are points in their games where you can control other characters for a minute, but that's all it is, and usually because something has happened to take the leading man out of the action. But in Final Fantasy XIII, everyone has equal billing. I've controlled Saz just as much as I've controlled Lightning. Vanille and Snow have had their time as party leader, and now it's Hope's turn. Sure, Lightning is on the cover art, but let's be real, out of all the characters we have in the party at this point, Cloud Strife but Sexy Lady is the one that's going to sell copies. My only complaint about the whole changing party leader thing, I can't say I'm a fan of the paradigms resetting. Every time the party leader changes, I have to reorganise my paradigms, even when it's the same two members. I get them changing when a new team is paired up, but why, when the same characters have been together for hours, do I need to recreate my paradigms just because Vanilla is a party leader now instead of Saz? Admittedly, it's a minor inconvenience as opposed to a major issue, but I haven't had a good moan in a while. Back to Hope and Lightning, and Hope has one of the quickest character arcs I have ever seen, going from petulant child to wannabe murderer to resistance fighter in about 20 minutes. Another gameplay variation now, and this time you have to kill everything in the area to disable security fences in order to progress. Boss time now, and this one was a real test of skill. It constantly changes its elemental resistances and hits with the force of a tank. I enjoyed this one. It kept me on my toes and was quite challenging, and it was a genuine relief to finally beat it. And once it's down, the Crystarium expands again, and I had enough CP saved up from this little excursion that I was able to max it out again. Back to Vanille and Saz, and this area is breathtakingly beautiful and easily one of the best looking in any Final Fantasy game. We get a flashback for Saz filling in a bit of his backstory, and they're introduced to the idea of avoiding encounters, something that seems really obvious and shouldn't really have to be explained, but then I realised I've been fighting everything in sight and the thought of running past enemies had never actually crossed my mind. Either way, I was a bit annoyed about this one. How dumb does the game think I am that I couldn't figure out to avoid strong enemies myself? So, obviously, I started a fight with the first one I saw, and fuck me, this fight was long. Really should have heeded that warning. Time for a moan, and this isn't so much a complaint about Final Fantasy XIII, but games in general that do this. Why can't I open the treasure chest when an enemy is alerted to my presence? The only logical justification I can think of is, if I'm busy opening a treasure chest, I'm open to enemy attack. And to that I say, good! If I'm opening a chest and an enemy attacks me, that is entirely my fault. It adds a sense of risk-reward and I genuinely believe it's a choice that should be left to the player and not one made for us by the devs. Anyway, another gameplay variant now is Vanille and Saz come across weather-changing orbs. Activating the orbs and changing the weather causes the enemies in the area to change. It's a soft puzzle where you have to manipulate the appearance of strong enemies, clearing them from your path. After the four little gimmick areas so far, I'm including Hope's mech walk in the security fences, this is the one I've enjoyed the least. I get the idea behind it. Final Fantasy XIII is a very linear game, so shaking things up every now and then keeps things interesting. But I find this one to be more of an annoyance than a fun diversion. The three-way battles taught us how to use new roles, the mech walk opens the way forward, and the security fences need to be switched off in order to progress. But here, if we're feeling fancy, we can just run past everything or engage in battle with the strong enemies. You can still get to your final destination without changing the weather if you so wish, rendering the thing kind of pointless. We switch back to Lightning and Hope now as they sneak into Hope's hometown, Pomplamoose. It's Palum Polum! And things really begin to kick off from here. We get backstory for both characters and see the reluctant partners start to become friends. Snow finally gets his hero moment and returns to the party, and from this point on, the story gets amazing. There is so much going on. Huge character threads get resolved. We get a final party member, Fang. There's a pretty big reveal regarding herself and Vanille that I won't go into here, but I will say there's a reason that they sound like they're from down under. Snow and Hope have to team up and fight their way through the streets, and I noticed some unique combat dialogue from Snow aimed at Hope, which was a really nice touch. Thanks, Hope. There's a noticeable increase in enemy difficulty, and the constant push toward both parties' goals gives the whole scenario a sense of urgency and desperation. Snow Hope, Lightning and Fang are pursued through the streets, and Palampolum becomes a war zone. It's non-stop action, 
tough battles, tons of story, and the finale hits another huge character moment for Hope, and to be honest, by the time it was over, I was absolutely exhausted. Taking control of Saz and Vanille again provides a little bit of respite as they explore Nautilus and play with some chocobos, but as soon as I began to enjoy the silence, it all kicks off again. Psychom attacks and the pair have to fight their way through an army. There are some huge revelations for both characters with massive ramifications resulting in Saz summoning his Eidolon, and this fight was a pain in the arse. Not as much as the Odin fight, but after using Libra a couple of times and seeing how best to win, I did just that and failed three times. My fourth try was essentially me saying fuck it and going on an all out magic attack and I managed to beat it with almost a minute to spare. All this struggle was in vain however as the pair get captured. So now it's back to the main party for a rescue mission and they absolutely tear their way through the airship Palamecia. Once the entire party meets we get another boss battle and unlock the ability to customise the active party. This is a massive relief. Even though several party members have the same roles, they all have different abilities unlocked within that role. So the ability to build a team out of the characters I like with the abilities I like is great, in theory, but we'll get to that. Annoyingly, and this is something I've mentioned before, but it is starting to piss me off now. I really wish there was a system in place that saved the paradigm list for each party combination you make, because having to redo my paradigms every time I swap a character out for one battle is really fucking tedious. Anyway, the party rush forward toward another cutscene with huge story implications and a massive boss battle. And remember that thing I just said about being able to build a team out of the characters I like with the abilities I like? Yeah, this boss says no way punk. I was absolutely annihilated by it on my first try. So I swapped out Vanille for Snow, switched on Sentinel and chipped away at the bastard until victory was mine. Honestly, for as cheap as the win was, this fight was a lot of fun. It was a good challenge and a satisfying win and on top of everything else, it's a great way to end disc 2. The last few hours have been pretty much non-stop gameplay and story with a handful of minigames thrown in for good measure. It's felt like a mid-season finale to a TV show, which makes sense seeing as it was all leading to the end of disc 2. The training wheels have been off for a while now and it's been genuinely great. And I know I'm in the minority here, but the last few hours really highlight the reason I've genuinely loved the linear gameplay up to this point. Final Fantasy XIII has momentum I don't think I've ever felt in a JRPG. From the moment the game begins, opening on a moving train, it's letting you know what the deal is. You are constantly pushing forward with very little respite and from a narrative standpoint this linear focus really works. You are constantly moving toward a goal, whether you be running from an army or heading to a destination, whatever you're doing at that point in time you have a singular focus. Add to this the fact that the party of fugitives on the run, again the constant drive forward fits the story. As does the fact the party you'll see slaves to the foul sea whose main goal is to complete their focus. It could be argued that the linear level design with only one direction to progress is itself a metaphor for this enthrallment. The team moving toward their goal like zombies, with free will being nothing but an illusion, heading toward a destiny they can't escape. Up to this point, Final Fantasy XIII is a fantastic example of ludonarrative consistency, meaning the actions of the characters and the gameplay itself actually reflect the narrative making for a much more immersive experience. And it was completely unintentional. In a 2014 interview with US Gamer, game director Matomo Toriyama explained that the linearity came down to limited development time and wanting to maximise players' gameplay experience, which itself makes Final Fantasy XIII an excellent example of how artistic intent and viewer, or in this case player, interpretation can differ greatly. Uh, thank you. This three starts with the gang trapped in what they perceive to be a Lassie training ground. After a pretty tough fight with regular enemies, the Crystarium unlocks all roles for all party members. It's hard to get excited about this just yet because the cost to unlock this skill and attributes in these extra roles is insanely high, so I'm just going to ignore them for now. This area is tough and it took me a lot longer than it probably should have, thanks to the fact that you get some decent CP from the enemies here, so I decided to grind for a bit. And holy shit am I glad I did, because the boss at the end is the toughest in the game so far. The first phase of the fight is fine, but it's just him leading you into a false sense of security. After he loses about a third of his hit points, he transforms and just unleashes hell. 
He constantly casts buffs on himself, debuffs the party, guards against attacks and hits like a freight train. He has a combo that if he hits the party leader with it, it's basically a one hit kill and game over. Even when I switch my team up, using Snow in his sentinel role to tank his attacks and using Vanille as both saboteur and healer, the fight took me like 13 minutes and I received zero stars. <laughs> Which brings me to a side note, at the end of battles you get a screen with stars in that. I honestly don't understand it at all. Sometimes you'll smash a fight and get 3 stars, other times you'll win by the skin of your teeth and get 5 stars. And even though fights have a goal time, time taken to finish the fight doesn't seem to affect it at all. I don't get it. After this mother of a boss fight, the level continues and honestly it massively outstays its welcome. It's a lot of copy pasted rooms and corridors and it just seems to go on and on and on. And Ariston. The tedium reached a point where I just started running past all the enemies because I wanted to get out of there. For context, out of the 25 hours I've put into the game by this point, 5 of those hours were spent here. Eventually, I got to the end. Fang has a tantrum and her Eidolon is summoned, and now I get to fight the one and only Bahamut. Which, after killing me only once, turned out to be the easiest Eidolon fight in the game so far. Which was nice. After that, the party find a ship and make their way to the world below, Grand Pulse. Once we get to Grand Pulse, Hope goes missing and the gang have to find him. We're given a taste of how tough the wildlife here is, but standard fights give us around 1000 CP, so it doesn't take long for the party's crustariums to catch up to that threat level. Once rescued, Hope gets emotional and his Eidolon is summoned. Naturally, I came very close to beating it first try, but because of the time spent casting Libra to see how to beat it, I ran out of time again. The second time I just hit the fucker and beat it with over 20 seconds to go, so with the exception of Snow, Eidolons can just be defeated by throwing magic at the bastards. So Hope wins and gets himself an Eidolon and an ATB increase. And here we are. After 25 and a half hours, we've made it to the open field of Grand Pulse. And I fucking hate it. Here, we're introduced to missions which are essentially monster hunts. Examining a seeth stone in the field will give you a mission to hunt down and fight a monster. Finishing missions will awaken other seeth stones to accept more missions, but you can only take one active mission at a time. Hunts range in difficulty from D to A, D being the easiest and A being the most difficult, and several special seeth stones allow you to teleport between them once their missions have been completed. And that's it. That is pretty much all there is to do here. It's filler content. Grand Pulse feels like the devs realised they only had maybe 30 hours of solid game with Final Fantasy XIII, so in an attempt to pad it out and prolong the experience, they created a field hub, stuck a handful of corridors to it, and filled it with badly spaced out side quests. There is a huge difficulty spike in the enemies to force a grind, which is mostly masked by the missions. Running from Seed Stone to target, Seed Stone to target, etc, etc, fighting Everything in your path does a decent job of catching you up crystarium wise but eventually, the missions themselves become quite tough, so conventional grinding takes over, and before you know it, you spend several hours in Mahabra farming hoplites and cryohedrons. The common opinion surrounding Final Fantasy XIII is that once you get to Grand Pulse and the game opens up, it gets good. But saying it quote unquote opens up is a massive exaggeration and it certainly doesn't get good. In fact, in my experience, Grand Pulse kind of makes it worse. Up until this point, Final Fantasy XIII has been a tight, linear, narrative driven experience. But this quote unquote open part brings that momentum to a standstill. It's like the pod race in Star Wars Episode 1 The Phantom Menace. Say what you will about that movie, you can't deny that up until the pod race, it moves at a clip. The story moves forward at a breakneck pace, every scene pushing the Jedi toward eventually finding Anakin, and then at the one hour mark, the movie comes to a screeching halt for 10 minutes as we're forced to watch George Lucas's homage to Ben-Hur. It adds nothing to the story that couldn't have been done in a much shorter scene and destroys any momentum the movie had up to this point. And it's the same here. Only instead of 10 minutes, the journey stops for 20 plus hours. The quote unquote freedom given to the player here amounts to little more than a field that takes far too long to run across, two corridors which lead to dead ends, and a corridor that continues the story. Due to only being able to select one mission at a time, there is far too much backtracking and wasted time. Trying to take on any other missions while one is already active will overwrite the active mission, so you're forced to do them one at a time. 
This, again, feels like an attempt to artificially pad out and prolong the experience, which just fucking sucks if you think about it. From accepting a mission to finding a target, I would run past so many seed stones, and instead of activating them and making a log of active targets to find as I explore, I'd have to just run past them and come back later. Eventually, after several hours and a handful of missions, you unlock the ability to ride chocobos, but chocobos are only rideable in the main field. As soon as you pass through the exit to Mahabara to continue the story, you're back on foot. Which is a shame, because riding chocobos is fun. You get around a lot quicker, you can access areas that the party can't access by foot. Knocking into enemies won't initiate combat, which makes getting around a lot easier. Instead, the chocobo will drop a feather and lose stamina, which it gets back if it doesn't get hit for a little while. I've always enjoyed riding chocobos in Final Fantasy games, and I wish there was more of it here. And now, here's an awkward transition to talking about shops that will make sense in a moment. Due to a lack of towns and villages in Final Fantasy XIII, shops are available at save points, and up until this point, they're pretty much useless as money's very scarce. Luckily, thanks to the chocobos, you can find treasure that can be sold at shops for a high price, finally giving you the resources you need to buy stuff. You can get weapons, accessories, healing items and materials for levelling up weapons, and as the game progresses, more shops and options become available. And that's all there is to say on that. What else? The map, too, is a bit of a mess. It helps you keep tabs on which stones are active, inactive, and complete. Active stones appear greyed out, and the active ones appear in colour and faintly flash white, which can actually make things quite confusing. Adding to the confusion is the fact the maps, both mini and main, rotate to keep whoever you're controlling facing forward, which can make checking the map in the main menu really disorientating because it's constantly rotating. Look, I'm not a fan of directionless open world experiences. Once I finish a game like Assassin's Creed and don't have the story to drive me forward, I couldn't care less about collecting feathers and whatnot. It's just aimless busy work, and this whole area feels like that crammed into the middle of the game. Luckily, once I decided enough was enough and I'd experienced my fellow side quests, it's a straight shot to the boss. The story gets back on track and a lot of questions are answered. Vanille gets her idolin, which I of course die to at least once. The gang climb a tower that doesn't outstay its welcome and has some very light puzzle elements which up until now have been rather scarce. And we eventually find ourselves in the village of Erba for some light exploration and a huge boss battle. Baiting the boss nets as a ship to take us back to Cocoon, and we're given the option of tying up any loose ends before doing so. Ooh, go on then. I'll give the rest of the missions a crack, I naively say to myself. So that's what I did for the next few hours until I got to this part with a mission tree. Beating one mission gives you the option of two missions to choose from, and beating one of those gives you two more. This is fine, as it clumps a bunch of missions together, but in order to get them all, you have to redo the same missions again and again and again to get new missions, and I fucking hate this so much, so it's time to return to Cocoon. Throwing in the towel here honestly annoyed me, as it looks like there's a big special boss fight I'm missing out on, but the repeated fights have worn me down to the point I don't care anymore. I am officially done with Grand Pulse. I realise that this has been a big slice of negativity in a mostly positive video, and I feel I should apologise for that. I don't want to bring the vibe down. But there is just so much filler content on Grand Pulse, it's difficult not to be worn down. And the real shitter is, I spent close to 25 hours on this part alone. I'll be honest, this part of the video is difficult to write. I dropped off the game hard, and really had to push through Grand Pulse and revisiting it in my mind to write up my thoughts was just as exhausting. But now it's time to head back to Cocoon, and the adventure is starting to wrap up. But in true Final Fantasy fashion, any chance of respite is thrown out the window, because when we arrive, the world is on fire. Portals are opening all over the place, and monsters of all shapes and sizes from Grand Pool step through and attack. I found this cutscene quite difficult to watch. I can't remember if I was drunk or tired, perhaps both or neither, but there is so much happening so quickly my brain couldn't keep up with what my eyes were seeing and I just wanted it to end. After that thrilling cinematic, the party make their way along some rafters above the racetrack they just blew up. I find Lightning's Lionheart Sword, get excited because I think of the sword of the same name in Final Fantasy VIII. The gang make it to the end of the rafters and free fall to the ground in a scene that echoes one from the beginning of the game, only instead of Saz messing it up because he's a panicky twat, the party gracefully drop to the ground, showing how they're now in sync. 
apart from Vanille, who falls to the ground like a panicky twat. Next, the party fight their way through hordes of soldiers along the now destroyed racetrack for a while, and then it's boss time. This boss is more annoying than difficult. It relentlessly blasts the party with weak laser beams in a tactic I can only compare to death by a thousand cuts. But once I got into the rhythm of the fight, I was able to drop it with no real issue. After the boss, it's straight into another annoying fight against an adamant something that just hits the entire party for big chunks of damage and takes far too long to bring down. Back to running through the streets and it is pure carnage. There are enemies everywhere, both man and monster alike. Luckily, they're preoccupied fighting each other, so it's easy enough to run past most of the enemies here. I could probably use the Crystarian point, but I spent so long grinding on Grand Pulse, I'll take my chances. Eventually the party arrive at a seemingly impassable gate, which is quickly followed by a cute reunion I won't spoil here. More fighting in the streets, more enemies avoided until we get to the heart of Eden, and that annoying boss from earlier is back in even worse than before. This time around it keeps switching between two forms, and after a while it begins to feel like a war of attrition, which is wild considering the fight is over in less than 10 minutes. From here we enter Orphan's Cradle, the final stretch toward the end of the game. Shortly after entering, two portals open up, one to the Eden Hall, the area outside, and one back to Grand Pulse to mop up any missions you may have missed. And I've got to be honest, despite everything I said earlier, I am so tempted to return there and 100% those missions. But no, I must press on because I have the same feeling of physical unease I get when nearing the end of a book or being stuck behind a slow walker, which now I'm writing it down just sounds like I'm being impatient, but it is so much more than that. I don't know, it's weird. Anyway, Orphan's Cradle is fine, I guess. It suffers from Final Fantasy-itis, wherein the devs didn't know how or when to end the game well. So here we are, in a floating corridor in a void surrounded by moving platforms. The enemies are tough, and there are three mini-bosses to fight before we get to the final boss. None of them are particularly interesting, and by the second one I was ready to move on to the final boss, but no. 3 is the magic number. The final boss itself has 3 stages and is without a doubt one of the worst boss fights in this series. Not just for difficulty, which it is until it isn't, it's just so unbelievably boring. The first phase is a boss we've already fought twice before, only it hits harder and has a ton more hit points. If you don't beat it quick enough, it'll cast doom on your party leader and you'll have around 3 minutes after that to kill it or it's game over. It's a painfully dull fight, and it took me way longer than it should have. And even though I managed to beat it in 11 minutes on my second try, the fight still felt like it lasted at least half an hour. And that's just the first phase. The second phase is an absolute nightmare. It opens with an attack that obliterates the party, then switches between light and dark. Light sees it use physical attacks and heal itself, and Dark has it drowning you in debuffs. It's easy enough to get into a rhythm of attack, heal, attack with it and chip away at its health. It just takes fucking forever. But once it's taken enough damage, it starts firing off instant kill magic, and it took out my party leader in one shot, which, after making such slow progress, was absolutely soul crushing. Apparently, it's susceptible to death magic, so on another attempt, I tried casting that a bunch, and nothing happened until I died again. I reloaded saves, and I even considered going back to Grand Pulse to grind for a few hours, but that thought tipped me over the edge. I was tired, I was defeated, and I went to bed. When I tried again, I decided to change up the team. I was using Lightning, Snow and Vanille, and it was painfully hard work. But once I switched out Snow and Vanille for Fang and Hope, everything changed. This boss that was so cheap and difficult and beat me to the verge of tears suddenly became one of the quickest and easiest boss fights in the game. It was insane. I managed to defeat it in just 7 minutes. I couldn't believe it. I felt like such a fucking idiot. After that fight, there's another cutscene and a final third form. This was a walk in the park and was just there as filler, and I don't know why the devs feel the need to even put it there. And that's it. Ending cinematic, which I'm not spoiling here. Roll credits. So does Final Fantasy XIII deserve the hate? Not at all. 
It's a genuinely fantastic game when playing to its strengths, such as tight linear level design, a super focused and forward moving story, fast paced, engaging and deceptively strategic combat. It's visually stunning, especially for a game that came out in 2009. Masashi Hamauzu's score is one of the best in the series and for the most part it is an absolute joy to play, but it isn't without its problems. As good as the Crystallarium is as a system, the novelty of its execution runs out real quick. Holding down a button and watching a grid slowly fill up as a number counts down gets incredibly tedious. And there would be times where I wouldn't level up my characters because I just couldn't be bothered to spend time in the Crystallarium. Constantly having to remake paradigms after swapping party members is also an annoyance as is all the filler no killer open world of Grand Pulse, which sadly takes up almost half of the game. I've seen people complaining about the difficulty too, and although I didn't mind the challenge, in fact I quite enjoyed it, I do agree that the party characters being able to hit for tens of thousands of hit points against enemies with health in the millions does come across as excessive and feels like a cheap way to artificially increase difficulty. Maybe I'm a purist. But in Final Fantasy games, the maximum damage anyone should be able to do with one hit is 9999. I think the biggest issue with Final Fantasy XIII is simply that it was ahead of its time. It took the linearity and upgrade system of Final Fantasy X and streamlined it, while adjusting the battle system to almost real-time action levels. To see FF13's legacy, all you need to do is look at Final Fantasy VII Remake, which has more in common with XIII than it does its namesake, VII. It borrows 13's linear level structure, and the weapon upgrade system is essentially a stripped down Crystarium. Even the combat feels like the next stage in evolution to the system in place in 13. It just changes passively waiting for the ATB gauge to fill, to actively filling it yourself with real time attacks. In fact, I genuinely believe FF7 Remake's combat system would be improved if it just used ATB bars for magic etc instead of an ATB bar and magic points. I love Final Fantasy XIII. It isn't perfect, and a few things annoy the hell out of me, but they don't take away my enjoyment from the game as a whole. If you're not a fan, cool, I'm not here to change your mind. But if you're on the fence or have never played it, I highly recommend it. Enough time has passed that some of its controversial systems are now commonplace in other games, and if you enjoyed Final Fantasy VII Remake, I reckon you'll get a kick out of this too. It's cheap and easy to pick up secondhand, and at the time this video goes out, it's also on Xbox Game Pass. For those of you who have played it, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you're new. And most importantly, thank you so much for watching this monster of a video. I genuinely appreciate you taking the time. So thanks again, and I'll see you next time.